there are no points on offer and no pit stops to worry about. But just like the Formula One paddock, this is the first real chance to seriously size up the opposition. The man in everyone's sights, series champion Marcus Ambrose. It'd be nice to, to win a race early on with the number one on the side of the car. You know, I really want to try and win a race with that on the side of the car. With the, with the right number in the right position, it'd be great. Ambrose's biggest threat may come from within the Stone Brothers garage. Teammate Russell Ingle wants to prove a point in his second season with Ford, but he'll have to tread carefully. The much publicised race rage incident with Mark Scaife has the fans eagerly awaiting their first on-track encounter. If either incurs the wrath of officials again this year, they could be sidelined for three events. The Stone Brothers camp and HRT start with upgraded versions of last year's cars. Team Brock has been renamed Paul Wheel Racing and severed its ties with the icon. Wheel and Jason Bright finally stepping into VY Commodores. The guys have worked really hard here to, to get both these VYs, VYs um, you know, up to scratch and you know we've had two really good test days. We, we, as far as we're concerned we did a great job with the, with the VX last year under pretty tough circumstances with no testing and an older model car so um, this year should be a hell of a lot easier with a VY and, and testing so you know we, we're, we're pretty confident that we've got a reasonable package and you know we just got to put together the whole year and um, you know see where we end up. Larry Perkins operation has expanded to three cars Stephen Richards and Paul Dumbrell joined by Tony Longhurst back in a full-time gig. I tell you after being out of the car for a while it's just amazing how fast they are how quick they accelerate and how hard they brake they really are rockets. If you believe the talk, Triple Eight Racing will be the big improvers in 04. A successful British touring car pedigree and European engineering ideas should make this team's Falcons fast as the season progresses. So the guys have been awfully busy getting the cars done, but uh, they're already going so far so good, and uh, yeah, we're looking really forward to a great season. Radisic will be joined at Triple Eight by fast Brazilian Max Wilson. His seat at Dick Johnson Racing has been filled by Warren Luff after impressive performances with the team as an endurance driver. Graduating to the big league is Mark Winterbottom after a brilliant season in the second tier V8 series. Yeah, I was still under contract to Stone Brothers for three years, so um, they let me out of my contract and then I signed for two years with these guys. So um, now we've got SBR engines, so we've got good engines um, underneath, underneath us. There's been a change in employment practices at Gary Rogers Motorsport. Rather than hire a fast rookie, the experienced Cameron McConville has been brought in as Garth Tander's stable mate. Tolerating Garth, you know, but um, no, we get along pretty well. We've done a bit of training together over, over Christmas, a bit of bike riding and, and things like that, so uh, we're getting along fine. And I think by the time the Enduros come around, uh, I think we'll hopefully be quite competitive and be a good combination together for the two races. Cameron's previous ride now belongs to Jason Richards, but Lansvale Racing is now known as Tasman Motorsport. We've got Holden Motorsport engines, which is one of the big things uh, the team was lacking last year, and uh, so hopefully that will propel us forward in the championship. Canberra's Dale Breed is the surprise pick by Team Dynamic to replace Richards. Over at Ford Performance Racing, staff levels remain the same, but its driver lineup has been downsized. Craig Lowndes and Glenn Seaton carry the factory hopes. Former teammate David Bernard joins a new Gold Coast based outfit with Mark Noski using inventory from Lowndes' former employer, Zero Zero Motorsport. But this new operation is still in the formative stages, and Bernard won't hit the track until the first round of the championship. They're gritting up already at Albert Park for the first of the V8 supercar races. We'll take a break now and come back with more on your home of motorsport, the Foster's Australian Grand Prix weekend. at Albert Park. Very friendly racing conditions for the V8 supercar drivers as we get set for a start in the first of our net space V8 supercar events. Lots of V8 fans. You'll see some of the livery along with the Formula One merchandise around the circuit here. More than 51,000 fans yesterday through the turnstiles. A very big crowd here again today and many of them love their V8s. Very intense championship battle last year, which Marcus Ambrose concluded at Eastern Creek. We'll go down to the grid now with a few significant changes this year, as you might have seen before the break. 
Well, Marcus Ambrose, you've proudly got that number one on the side of the car, but these Holden blokes have come out firing. You're on row two. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell they're not real happy about it because they've come out in numbers this weekend. Really, I'm feeling pretty lonely here. I've got three in front, three, uh, three Commodores behind. It's going to be a tough race. From your point of view, tell us about your off-season. Sounds like you had a nice break from it all. Yeah, it's, um, it's the first time that I've actually finished a championship in first place. So really I had no aspirations to have anything but a great holiday. It's a nice sprint race coming up. Enjoy. Well, let's hope it works today. Adjustments to the car. We haven't made much adjustments. It's actually not that bad, Daz. i tell you what's been difficult with the track is seeing you run up here that's 50 metres running late. Are you whacked? Are you OK? Oh, I'm good. I've been training hard. <laughs> it was very funny. I was watching you. Trying to keep the radios in and run up. <laughs> It's been, a, uh, I guess, a bit of a surprise that uh, Holden's have been pretty dominant earlier on in, in, in this, this practice session. Yeah, look, I mean, the car from our test at Winton was good. When we rolled out, I, I, I said to the guys straight away, the car feels really good. Um, it's different to make it a good qualifying car, Daz, compared to a race car also. It's really hard on brakes here, so everyone will have brake drama, everyone will have rear tyre drama, and as the cars get a bit loose, they're, they're a bloody handful, so it'll be a good race. I'm going to watch it. Thanks, mate. Well, it's a sad state of affairs when the drivers start making fun of the commentary team. I think we've really reached a low point in the history of V8 supercar racing, but we hopefully will reach a high when they get underway. Uh, absolutely dramatic qualifying performance from Scaife, but then beaten comprehensively by Murphy in the shootout. As Scaife said, it should be terrific. We're on the warm-up lap now, late side for a start in the net space V8 Supercar Challenge. A quick run through the grid here for you before they get set for the start. Murphy and Scape, what a charge that'll be to the first corner. All Commodores. And on the second row of the grid, it's a Ford and a Holden, Jason Bright and the reigning champion Marcus Ambrose. Richards and Tanda on row three, that'll be a battle. Rick Kelly and Paul Radisich, seven and eight. Todd Kelly, that was a good uh, tussle with his brother in qualifying alongside Simon Wills. Further back on the sixth row, Jason Barguana for Mark Larkham's outfit and John Bow alongside him. Russell Inkle a long way behind his teammate in qualifying, Steve Ellery next door. Paul Wheel and Cam McConville now in Repco Valvoline colours for 2004. Anthony Tratt supported by Castrol Perkins Racing indirectly, customer car that one and Stephen Johnson with new teammate Warren Luck behind him. Position 19, Craig Baird alongside DJR newcomer Warren Luff. Winterbottom carrying number 20 for Orcon Racing and Brad Jones. Positions 23 and 24, Paul Dumbrell and Paul Morris, cars 8 and 29. Jason Richards with his new team and Mark Noski. 27 and 28. Tony Longhurst, a welcome return to the series, and Glenn Seaton, some electrical problems yesterday with that car. Max Wilson and more problems for FBR, resulting in Craig Lowndes alongside him in position 30. And further down, and finally, position 31 is Dale Breed in the Team Dynamics second entry, and he was the last little bit of the jigsaw to drop into place last week with the final announcements of the lineup for this year's championship season. This is a non-championship race. The championship kicks off at the Clipsal 500 in a couple of weeks' time in Adelaide. We're all looking forward to that one at Network 10. But I've said this a number of times in the last few weeks, don't for one minute think that this is some kind of an exhibition where they all just cruise around. The light goes off here and they go for it. They'll go berserk. They always do. It's a determined motor race. There's pride at stake, first blood at stake. Murphy took it yesterday with pole in the shootout. As Billy said, going to the break, Scaife was the one that delivered the thump after qualifying, but Murphy got the upper hand when it counted for grid positions. And Mark Scaife made a very good point going into the break that round here, brakes get annihilated on these hot, heavy cars, and the rear tyres don't like this layout after a while. And that's what we have to focus on as the race unfolds. It's only 10 laps, but it's a 5.3 kilometre circuit. And particularly heading to the first corner and up into turn three here, year on year, we have chaos with 31 V8 supercars all arguing over the same bit of real estate. I see no reason at all to change that view this year, Billy. It'll be interesting tomorrow, Neil, with nearly twice the race distance uh, to see them in action. But this will whet our appetites for sure as we wait for green. 
here at Albert Park. Murphy on the right of your screen with pole position, the better run of the first car, quarter. Last car. We're set. Listen to the V8 build. And a super start to the first supercar showdown Scape. race. And Scape has got off very well. Can he get enough on Murphy into the first quarter? He has. He has squeezed through. So a brilliant start to Mark Scape. And the pole sitter Murphy's been beaten off the line. Let's see if they can all squeeze through. It looks like they have, but they've used every inch of circuit and more. The traditional squeeze to the grass for the few of them at turn one, but Scaife dropped the clutch beautifully. You can tell from the minute he popped the clutch, he was going to ease in front of Murphy. It was an excellent start for him. Always the nose to tail action oh, down here. And as back. usual, that's exactly what happens. Well, well the team Kiwi car is off. Great bed. Can he get it going again? And it did look like a heavy contact with the wall, Neil, but... But there's enough nose to tail stuff down there in the mid pack for it to always unfold into a bit of nonsense at the critical moment. So Murphy slots into second. It's good positioning on the track for him. Then Bright, then Ambrose, then Tander. And Scaife will be happy that he's made a good jump and just got that first vital track position going into turn one. Oh, huge locking at the break there for Cameron McConville. He had both fronts locked. And a bit of aggravation here as well because I think uh, Warren Luff, big lock up for him on the way into turn nine. There's a couple of critical bumps there and the V8 supercars don't like those bumps, particularly on cold tyres and cool brakes. Glenn Seaton among the tail end is not a familiar position for him. And another lock up there. It may not be that. It could be that the guards folded on the tyre because of the contact back at turn three and every time he applies the brake, it just has a bit of a rub and the front of the car pitches forward. Yeah, he was involved in that little scuffle there that resulted in Baird nudging the wall. Huge enthusiasm from the crowd in Melbourne for this category of racing. A lot of people say they enjoy the V8s every bit as much, if not more, than the Formula One cars as the field roars through to end the first standing lap with Murphy hot in pursuit of Mark Keep Scaife. Keep your rhythm, mate. Keep your rhythm. Message to Mark Scaife. Keep your rhythm. Murphy right on him. Bright a little gap, then back to Ambrose, the first of the Fords in fourth position, then Tander holding station. I think it's a pretty good start for Stephen Richards is next, then Rick Kelly, Todd Kelly, and Paul Radisich is the next man through. Russell Ingle is in tenth, then Barguana, Wills, Ellery, Wheel, Bauer, McConville, Johnson, Brad Jones, Anthony Tratt, and Mark Noski is 20th. Certainly not a major problem for Jason Bright, but I guess one that's just in the back of his mind. Radio communication problems. The system sort of cracks in and cracks out depending upon what part of the track he is right now. Third place, radio will probably be the last thing on his mind. And when you get to the northern end of the racetrack here, it's always pretty scratchy, rusty under the trees and a long way from the pit lane. And you can imagine the number of radio signals that are zipping around in the sky around here at the moment. There's so much data and telemetry and information related to the Formula One, the broadcasting. This category, it's a radio nightmare. And this is probably traditionally the worst place for radios in a V8 supercar. Replay of the start shows that Mark Scaife pops the clutch beautifully. Murph did a great job, but he just dropped that half car length when it mattered. I thought they were surprisingly clean through turn one. A few blokes actually made it to the grass, but not wildly so. But there was a little bit of craziness heading up into turn three with the nose to tail stuff. And here's the replay of the start going to three. Look back to about positions eight or nine, and that's where you see it starting to unfold. There's a little bit of contact there. And then look at these guys. Bradley Jones gets stuck into one of the PWR cars, and then Craig Baird was the guy that came off. He fared worse. He just had to lock up to avoid, and that was what carted him to the left. Yes, Luff was caught up in the aftermath Ooh, I can of hear that. someone making a yes. mess of turn 15. And I think it was Scaife. It looked like it was Scaife. It's bright now in second place. And he's putting a bit of pressure on. Greg Murphy, in fact, no, Murphy will hold out as they head down the straight. Well, wonder what the story is there. That's allowed Ambrose to buy into this battle. He's got the ideal race line because the two leading guys were cheating time from each other. Something has occurred into turn 15. We heard the squeal of the tyres from Scaife's car. Did he and Murphy make contact? Did Scaife lock the rear brakes? Well, 
El Marcus was looking to capitalise there as Murph tried to cover himself. Bright showed plenty of speed there in the straight. Greg Rust. If the radio chat is anything to go by, it does sound like there may have been contact between the two here. This may paint a clearer picture. Yes, there was. There was. You'd need to see it again. It looked like Murphy made a dive up the inside. That was what bunched the pack up. That was why Marcus got back in touch with this group. And the question remains, did he get far enough down the left-hand side of Mark Scaife's car to not incur the wrath of the officials? So that will get Mark Scaife's aggro arometer up. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just invented on the spot. It'll do. It makes sense. And that's, of course, why Murphy lost momentum too and why Brighty was able to put so much pressure on him down that straight. So Murph was in covering mode. So we've got a really interesting little battle going here. It's a popular place to pass at turn 15 because it's a slow speed left-hand corner with a quick approach and there's a lot of track width there. So Murphy felt he must have had a run at 14 and he looked up the inside but it didn't look as though he was able to get it done. And uh, contact has prevailed between them. Here comes Todd up the inside. He's in car 22 this year. We're going to have to do some readjustment. Different colour wheels on the Holden Racing Team and the FPR cars this year. Oh. Look at this. Aggravation. Will they get through here? Just side-by-side -side action for Max Wilson, I believe, with Todd Kelly. Or is it no, Radisich? Radisich. Radisich. Radisich, yes. Just squeeze Kelly off the track. Let's see if we've got more bumping going on here. That's Russell Engel. And Rick Kelly was pounded into that wall. So, you said it, Neil. They are fair dick about there. Yeah, don't for, think for one minute it's got anything to do with points. Actually, that's huge damage. He needs, he needs to stop. Let's punch the dip across on that car. It's broken the Watson Inc. bolt. And, uh... So we've got Murphy in the lead from Brighton and Ambrose. Garth Tander's next, and then Richo. And then we have quite a gap to the man who almost triggered a lot of that problem we saw there. Paul Radisich, who was daringly going up the inside. Let's go to the pits. I'm down uh, with Jeff Gretz. Jeff, uh, I guess we can say glad this ain't championship points. Yeah, it's a bit, bit chaotic out there, Daryl. Um, you think a few of the drivers would use their heads a little bit, uh, given that uh, you know, the next, next race is going to be a tough one. But, uh, you know, we, we're not out there with them, so it's in their hands. I'm marked to be disappointed that he got a bit of hurry up from Murphy and nudged him off, but uh, it's the way it is. We'll just recover and get back there. I guess a positive that the cars look pretty strong so far. Yeah, no, the, look, the guys done a fantastic job off, off season, so, um, you know, little things like this you can never account for, but the, the cars themselves and the guys are reasonably happy, so that's good. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Let's hear now from Greg Rust as we see Murphy still holding the lead from Bright and Ambrose. Well, a little further down the order, Bill, Brad Jones uh, on the, the radio. Quite a deal, actually, to the Aussie Mail team. So some dramas for Brad Jones. It sounds like it's in the engine. And Craig Lowndes has also spoken to the engineers at Ford Performance Racing. Both he and teammate Glenn Seaton had some niggling electrical problems with their cars yesterday. But it sounds like, uh, as a result of that, the lack of track time for both of those drivers, Craig's now uncovered a handling problem of some sort. Bit oversteery for Craig Lowndes out there right now. They had to ditch their test day earlier this week at Winton. Many of the key teams went to Winton and tested their first of the year. But uh, here's a replay of the Ingle Rick Kelly incident, and uh, Ingle tried to go up the inside. They got side by side, and uh, Kelly ends up in the wall at turn 16, and that's pretty big damage on that car. That'll be a pretty big job for these guys. There's a short turnaround between this race meeting, and there's Rick on foot back to the pit lane. They've all got to be parked up in Adelaide by the middle of uh, the week after next for the opening round of the championship. Jason Barkwinder is the next target for Russell Ingall. A little further up the track is Radisic. And then you have that top five of broken away. Stephen Richards at the back of them. And uh, it's not going to be, I mean, right or wrong, whether you're the, whether you're the, uh, the sender or the receiver in V8 Supercar Racing, you need to front the stewards when these incidents happen. And that'll mean that uh, Russell has got to go back into the stewards' room after all that aggravation at Eastern Creek last year, Darrell. Well, I'm actually on, uh, on the other side of the fence, I guess, Rick Kelly, you're pretty pumped up about this. What happened from your side of the, of the fence? Uh, it's just sort of a thing that's not necessary at the Grand Prix. Um, Russell will just give me a tap and um, sent me into the wall, so I've just got to let the guys know that um, we need to get the car out of here and fix it for Adelaide. How bad is the damage? It looks quite bad. Um, like, it's quite a fast area there. You don't want to have contact, and he just you know, quite blatantly put me into the wall, so 
It is damaged quite bad, so we need to get it out of here, I think. Well, we see this as an issue by the team. Will they take it further? Well, absolutely. It's just not necessary, especially at the Grand Prix. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Well, don't forget, Russell is on uh, very thin ice after that last round incident last year. Well, he and Mark Schaefer uh, on uh, suspended sentences, and uh, they put a foot wrong this year, and they could uh, be on holidays for three race meetings. So uh, that was the outcome after we left you at the compl completion of the championship at Eastern Creek, the stewards' findings. So uh, Rick actually was a bit out of breath then, wasn't he? He'd been running so far. I think they're probably well aware that the car looked pretty ugly, didn't they, that he needed to run back and tell them that it was that bad. So uh, they'll cart that car away in a pretty second hand. Bradley Jones is reporting a, uh, and it's some evil handling in this car, which wouldn't be the first time. And they've pulled it off the circuit to be able to have a look and see what the problem is and try and ascertain the drama and get on top of it. Uh, I was going to mention that FPR didn't get to complete their test day earlier in the week and they had to do a lot of work during the week to get their cars finished for the race meeting this weekend and then yesterday both cars in the wars and um, not surprisingly when they go and try and race them today without any track miles after a big re-engineer across the summer period they've got uh, their hands full trying to get the things to work. Let's go back to Rusty. Well Brad's actually putting the, uh, the window net back up. It's uh, a little unsure this team. They're telling him to go back out. Let's see if they can feel something with this car. He complained at one point, Neil, he thought it was in the rear axle, but they looked around the front end as well, so... Maybe it's an axle or something. There you go. He just backed up what you said, Rusty. The dulcet tones of Bradley Jones on the radio, and he'll join the Network 10 commentary team this weekend, I understand, calling the Celebrity Race. So uh, that'll be something to look forward to. If the celebrities aren't entertaining, Bradley usually is. And I think uh, he should be able to squeeze you into the commentary box. So it'll be a pretty close run thing after the V8 supercar race, of course. If if we keep having these breakdowns, there might be plenty of drivers with something to do by the time we get to that part of the weekend. Oh, much. oh, Jason Bright there with a the moment. He got on the grass. He was pressuring Murphy heavily. That'll make him vulnerable at 13. And Marcus knows that. So Jason stuck to the right to block. But Marcus has got the ideal race line. Can he get up the inside for 14? Has he got better corner exit speed? Brighty knows it, moves across. This is the allowable chess in this business, folks. You are allowed to do it until such time as the car following gets to the B pillar, which separates the front and rear doors on the car. And then you've got to yield. Well, Murphy was doing plenty of that to Jason a little while back. Now we have this terrific battle up front with the job, three drivers. You're doing a great job, just be patient, you'll get there. You're doing a great job. That's the message to Marcus. And uh, it looks like he might have a stronger car at this critical phase of the race, lap seven of ten. Tander is the fourth car there, trying to bridge the gap and join in this battle. A little gap to Stephen Richards and then another gap to Radisic. I tell you, it's thin on the ground in Fordland, isn't it? You've got uh, Ambrose in third, you've got Ad uh, Radisic in sixth but uh, a lot of competitive holdings, it seems, at the start of the season. And uh, Bright, of course, on that subject, is going into this season with a much stronger Ooh, car this. in terms of potential. But having said that, his teammate is struggling a little bit further back in the field. That's cost Paul Wheel. Ninth position and trouble two for Mark Scaife. Mark Scaife is back in the field. I hesitated there for a moment because I wasn't sure what happened to Scaife after his earlier problems. So trouble for Russell Ingle. He's ended up in the kitty litter there. That's a very vulnerable spot and he won't get out of there. Looks like it's all over, Russ. You look pretty buried, mate. Can you get out from me? Here's a replay. Car no, 16 won't. tags him and uh, he hasn't got far enough up the inside. <laughs> There's been plenty of biff and now, What happened with Scaife? Someone got into the back of Scaifey there too. Now, he's a little bit further back in the distance. We might just see as... You, when these things happen, it sends off a concertina, so I'd say someone's then got stuck back into and car number two. Yes, and we don't know actually who the perpetrator was. Might have been... Well, Stephen Johnson was thereabouts, but I certainly won't put the finger of blame on him. It's impossible to tell. Yeah, car 16 being black flag. No surprise there for Paul Wheel because he just... Uh, there was... Um, Nothing like enough uh, space down the inside to get the job done on Russell. So the race director has determined that uh, that was uh, a move that was pretty easy to interpret from race control. And they felt it wasn't appropriate. So uh, he's going to have a little holiday through the pit lane. 
and uh, Russell Ingle, uh, he's buried. He's not going anywhere. And sometimes, if, um, if we weren't probably at this critical late stage of the race, if the race was longer, they would definitely deploy the safety car for that one and get that car out of the gravel at turn three because if anybody else goes in there, it'll launch straight into that car. See the yellow flag, stationary yellow flying to warn these oncoming competitors. No passing, and there is an issue dead ahead. There's the wave yellows, double yellows there to, to uh, step up the urgency of the issue. Jason Bright's form last year. They've actually got a tractor in there now just pulling out the Caltex car. Was uh, quite exceptional in the sense that he led the championship for the first few rounds without winning a race. The problem was he was in the VX Commodore and uh, there were all those problems with testing following, following the ownership wrangle uh, with the collapse of Tom Walkinshaw Racing and... Here's the race score, Bill. Murphy leads from Jason Bright, Ambrose third, Tander, then Stephen Richards, Paul Radis issues sixth. Then we've got Jason Bargwana, Simon Wills, Todd Kelly, John Bow, Steve Ellery, Cam McConville is 12th. Further down at Stevie Johnson. Traddy is 14th. Paul Wheel, he'll uh, be making that trip into the pits, so he'll drift down the field. Morris, Scaife is 17th, then Dumbrell. Glenn Seaton and Craig Lowndes, the two partners at FPR, 19 and 20. Noski, then Jason Richards, Max Wilson down in 23rd, Tony Longhurst next. Oh, look, they've got Russell out. Whoa, hang on, Rusty, where are you off to? Ingle is all over the place here. Looks like he might be doing a bit of... No, uh, you know what he's doing? He's just cleaning the gravel off his tyres because uh, they'll be embedded with dust and garbage, so he's just trying to burn that muck off so that he can get on. In the meantime, what a contest for the top three. Bright, so close to Murphy there. Any one of these guys knows they could win this race in certain circumstances. It is on, folks, for another year. V8 Supercar Racing. Two to go. Two laps to go. We've just heard it on the radio. And giving chase, of course, in the distance is Garth Tander. But this, we hope, will be a year in which Jason Bright will not run out of steam because of reaching a dead end in development. The VY is going to make him strong, not only out of the box, but through the oh, course of the year. Ambrose locks up. He Actually, weaved into the back of Bright there. I have to say, uh, top marks to Marcus there. He, he locked the brakes and he knew he was in trouble, so he actually threw the car sideways so that he didn't drill the back of Murphy and not only saved the front of his own car, but saved another competitor from an unfair smack in the backside. A really great presence of mind from Ambrose. And that... Uh, situational awareness was the mark of a bloke who's totally in control and uh, unfortunate that he's just locked the brakes here right there is the critical spot look then he puts more lock on the car just throws it sideways and he might have just, just touched, touched him but jason as you right, say but, uh, very 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 clever bit of driving there and i don't doubt for a moment that marcus had exactly that in mind when he took that evasive action and yeah, maybe just a little scratch on the passenger's door, but uh, big deal. And had he not done that, if he hadn't taken that um, evasive action, he would have uh, drilled straight into the back of that car with a good 10 or 20 k's more than the lead car of Jason Bright, and that would have had them both off in the gravel and uh, upset the apple cart all round on both sides of the fence. I can't help but say that that, uh, as we see Bright have a good crack at Murphy here. We'll come back to what I was just going to say. It wasn't that important, but... Bright is putting a lot of pressure on Murph, and this will be a good contest to the finish. Only two of the minute now. And look at the almost touching as they come to the 16th turn here at Albert Park. One and to go. Then it'll be the last lap. You can last see in the lap. distance last there that lap. the third car is still Garth Tander. And uh, that back end was uh, just moving around a bit from Garth when he came out of that corner. He's desperately trying to catch up. He's on the podium, safely in front of Stephen Richards, I think. Well, I was going to say, the sh we had a shot earlier of David Bernard in the new livery, uh, his new drive, of course, with Wright, Patterson, Shakespeare. And on the front of the car, with smoke coming out, it looked very much like, oops. <laughs> which kind of summed up the situation. But anyway, back to the action in front. These guys are really at it with three quarters of a lap to go and Murphy's just a bit vulnerable in a couple of places here. They've both got strong cars. Maybe Jason's got a tiny, tiny edge. He's in a difficult spot because his braking points are being blinded by Murphy. Murphy, Bright, Tander, Richards, Radisish, Ambrose, Bargwana, Wills, Kelly, Todd. 
and John Bow. So only two forwards in the top ten with Radisich in fifth and Bow in tenth. So swamped by competitive Holdens in the opening round. Good speed on exit there from Murphy as Bright tries to maintain the pressure, tries to force some sort of little error, some opening that he can exploit. Plenty of track width here at Albert Park compared to the circuits they'll face later in the year. I think brighty has got the headlights on now, so he's showing a bit of impatience. I don't think that'll have one iota of impact on Greg <laughs> Murphy. He'll say, well, that's nice, your headlights work. Don't forget, of course, the Clipsal 500 first round of the championship as Bright looks up the inside, but nowhere near. And the fastest way and the best way to protect your race line is to drive into the the uh, corner online as fast as you can, which is the quick way, and that's why Murphy wasn't vulnerable there at all. So uh, had he started to get too far offline, that's when you begin to leave yourself vulnerable to a slap around. Final corner, big drive to the finish here. It looks like Murph has Jason Bright safely held there. Just, oh, Brighty just left the track. The left rear went onto the dirt, and that'll give Murphy Thank enough you, breathing well space to win race one of the Net Space V8 Supercar Challenge this weekend. We're looking forward to a great battle though across the other two races. Tand crosses in third, Stephen Richards in fourth, ahead of Radisic, Ambrose, Bargwana in a good sprint to the line with Simon Wills. Good recovery there from Todd Kelly, John Bauer, Cameron McConville, Stephen Ellery, Stephen Johnson, Anthony Tratt, Paul Morris, Mark Scaife, livid and in 16th position ahead of Dumbrell, Seaton and Lowndes. What a start for Ford Performance Racing. Here we go, Greg Murphy. Well, he was strong last year. It just faltered in the final round, but he is picking it up very quickly again in 2004. Four Holdens at the top, then three Fords. Further down the order, solid performances throughout from some of the guys who've changed teams and, of course, are still settling in for a new season. We'll take a break and come back with more. They packed a lot into 10 laps, didn't they? An extraordinary start to the Net Space V8 Supercar Challenge. Wheel and Ingle clashing there. Here's another look from ground level. Synchronised spinning. And Russell is uh, certainly carving through the field at the moment. But let's hear from the guys who are up the front on the podium. Greg Rust. Well, what an incredible start, Greg Murphy, to the 2004 season, a non-championship round, but the gloves are off there, were they? Yeah, yeah, um, I don't know what Mark was doing. Um, he jumped on the brakes, like, way early going into the hairpin and, and uh, basically had no, uh, nowhere to go, so I went up the inside and then he closed the door, so I'm not sure if he had a drama or what, but it was, uh, it was pretty strange. It caught me by surprise. I mean, he, I was right behind him and then next minute he's uh, jumped on the pick, so, I mean, you are supposed to break for that corner, I know that, but uh, not that early, so... Unfortunate. Great start to the year for you, though. Well done. Yeah, the guys, guys done a great job. We've got a bit of work to do, which is that's what you know we're spending this race meeting doing, and and hopefully we can make the car a little bit better and keep improving it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Brody, that was uh, a pretty good battle and a bit of action up front as well. Yeah, it was a pretty good tussle. We, you know, we, we knew we had a car that was going to come on pretty strong towards the end of the race, and um, you know that it did. So we look forward to the race tomorrow. Um, that blue bloke by me obviously doesn't like losing too much, so you know he sort of bent up the rear of our car a bit on the last couple of laps there, which sort of spoiled our run a little bit on Murph. But you know, very happy for the team. You know, they, they did a great job putting the car together, and um, you know to be this competitive this early in the year is sort of bodes well for the rest of the year. Good luck tomorrow. Thanks, Dan. Well, Garth Tander, third spot, fantastic start of the year. Yeah, Rusty, fantastic. I mean, uh, we were just going out there to stay out of trouble, and we did that, no worries, and uh, everyone sort of fell off in front of us. So we've got a bit of work to do to, to run with the likes of uh, Murph, Bridey and Ambrose, but, uh, yeah, the signs are encouraging. Gary's opted for, I guess, an experienced second driver in the team this year. Is that helping you at all? Yeah, already it's been fantastic. Cameron's learned a lot in the testing that we've done, and, uh, you know, we've gone separate ways of setups here, and we've brought Cam's car back closer to where mine was for the race, and uh, he charged up to 11th, so uh, it's all working well. Awesome start to 04, GT. Yeah. Great, thanks Rusty. Yes, that's an interesting point that Garth Tander makes. Of course, Jason Barguana was no slouch when they were teammates. Uh, Jamie Wincup, big step up for him last year, replaced now by Cameron McConville, who is making an impact with that team. And let's hope they're a formidable opposition for the front runners in uh, 2004, because guys like Murphy, Scaife, Ambrose are going to make it a very, very good championship. But let's get back to the business at hand, of course, and that's Formula One. Neil Crompton, what can we read into this for?